Hi, I'm Sifu Cuddle, and in this video, we're going to be taking a look at these very unique swords from all the way back in the Han Dynasty, over 2,000 years ago. Now, these are fencing swords, and they offer quite a bit of extra hand protection, especially when compared to their counterparts on the battlefield. This is the shield guard Han Jian, and this is the D guard Han Jian. Both are made by LK Chen, and both are one-to-one -one reproductions of existing antique swords from all the way back in the Han Dynasty, almost two millennia ago. At first glance, they look everything but Chinese, and everything but first or second century swords. In fact, a quick Google search shows that their Western counterparts, like basket hilt swords and knuckle guard swords, weren't around until the 15th century at the earliest. Being that the Han Dynasty was nearly 2,000 years ago, and that most records were kept on organic materials like bamboo slats, there isn't a lot that has survived to this day, save for some very well-preserved writing and tomb carvings. So there's not a lot that we know about these swords. Of the dedicated articles on the subject, Cao Pi, the son of Cao Cao, wrote that fencing was actually very popular inside the imperial court as well as outside with the commoners. There were even dedicated schools and instructors to teach fencing. And the tomb carvings that I talked about weren't just a one-off depicting fencing, but it was actually a very common motif. But that's pretty much all we know about Han Dynasty fencing swords. Um, manuals or treaties for sword play and sword usage weren't written until the Ming Dynasty. So the best we can do is speculate about how these swords were used and with which techniques. One of the best ways that we can understand these swords is by simply comparing them to other common weapons that were around during the same era. Luckily for me, I have a couple of Han Jian from LK Chen that we can look side by side with these fencing swords. Let's start with the blade. The cross section is a diamond shape, almost lenticular, which would date these swords back to the later part of the Han or Eastern Han Dynasty. Earlier Jian had an eight-sided cross section, which made the blade more robust and in turn heavier. That means that these swords are actually quite light. But as suit for the Han Dynasty, they're also quite long. Even amongst the already long Han Jian, these two stand out with the D-Guard Han Jian at 33 inches of blade and the Shield Guard Han Jian at a whopping 38 inches of blade, landing it just four inches shorter than the longest two-handed Jian offered by LK Chen, the Striking Eagle. What also sets these two apart is the blade width. The D-Guard Jian is quite wide compared to the Shield Guard Jian, which is much closer to the other more common Han Dynasty Jian, which, due to their length and surprisingly lightweight, can be attributed to sophisticated forging practices. Now let's look at the most glaring difference between these swords and their battlefield counterparts, the guards. Both offer knuckle and hand protection, but in a different way. Although the D-Guard has less overall coverage, it also has an outward extension that could keep the opponent's blade from getting too close to the hand. On the Shield Guard, we have a bowl-like protector that has quite a bit more overall coverage. But that's not the only difference. When we take a closer look at common Han Jian of the time, we see a very minimalist theme, especially when it comes to the guard, that barely goes over the knuckles of the hand. Whereas with this sword, we see quite a bit of knuckle coverage, especially with the lengthy extended quillen. Now I have to mention that cross guards in general were never really absent in the Han Dynasty or previous dynasties. There were some that had a bit of a cross guard, but never to this length. Now as for the hilts, the D guard has a handle that actually exceeds the guard. And I'm going to go into that a little bit later as to why I think that is. The shield guard, on the other hand, has a shorter single-handed grip. Both handles have a diamond-shaped cross-section with some tapering as they near the guard, which are great for edge indexing and are wrapped with a braided waxed cotton cord for additional grip and comfort. 
The pommels are both diamond-shaped caps that match the handle profile and although provide support, do not add any weight for counterbalance. Even then, these swords are very lively and have some excellent tip control. Lastly, the scabbards are quite simple and based on a common minimalist design of the time. I doubt there are any existing scabbards, so it is more of a modern take, especially with the additional leather wrapping and metal fittings, as most historical scabbards were made of wood and coated with thick layers of lacquer, and also included belt hooks that are absent on these. So now it's time to speculate as to how these swords were actually used. Thanks to some tomb carvings and a shout out from Cao Pi, we know that they were fencing swords. And actually that's immensely helpful because that gives us context as to how these unique swords were used. When we look at this as a fencing sword, we know that they are not made for going out on the battlefield and killing. They are used for developing skill in a safe and controlled environment and most likely with rules and certain conditions and even a point system. But based on the various design elements that we just looked at, we can hypothesize how these swords would have been used and which techniques and concepts would have been emphasized. Being that these are the ancestors to our modern day Jian, we can further surmise how they can be applied and handle contemporary techniques. In other words, I'll tell you how they feel in motion and which techniques may have been favored just based off of their design. Now there's one more thing that I should mention before we go any further and that is I have an inherent limit as to how far I can experiment with these swords because these are both incredibly sharp swords and there is no way that I can use them in a safe sparring context without risking injury to myself or my partner. However, luckily LK Chen offers uh, unsharpened blades and even better, the sparring type blunted tips that are rolled over exactly for fencing. So you can further expand on what I start building in this video. We're going to begin with the assumption that the original swords were actually not sharp at all. Of course, there could have been some wooden training swords that were used for fencing, but since these were absent on the battlefield and the fact that this design was used exclusively for fencing, I'm going to expect that to keep the sport safe and continued that the lethality of these weapons was intentionally limited. Not to mention that fencing swords were often depicted on tomb carvings paired with the hook shield or the gulrong. Now there are gulrong that exist that have bulbed ends on all protrusions, which may have been used to hook more on the battlefield, but it actually matches more of a safer way to practice, especially in a fencing context. So it does lend to the belief that safety was a factor for fencing. And now that brings us to the guards, which offer quite a bit of hand protection. So we can easily speculate that there was a lot of hand hunting and wrist tapping going on. And since nobody likes bruised fingers or broken thumbs, they lengthened the guard coverage and as well expanded over the knuckles for added protection. The shield guard is more or less self-explanatory, but the D guard offers a couple of very unique elements, starting with this upward extension on the front of the guard. Now, this could have been used to catch or trap an opponent's weapon, and is very similar to what we see with modern hook swords or deer antler swords. But the element that stands out the most to me is here, especially on the D guard sword as we see that the guard terminates just a little bit below midway down the handle. Now, in looking at this and thinking about this, my idea is that for one, the handle length is to match the typical hanjian of the time that were being used out on the battlefield, which do have longer handles. So it would, it would match the maneuverability and the agility and feeling of the battlefield equivalent, but at the same time offer hand protection. Now, terminating here is specific to that you would keep a single-handed grip, as a two-handed grip is not really comfortable inside the guard or below it as well. So 
this would match how the swords were being used on the battlefield as single-handed swords as the other one was holding a shield or horse's reins. And that would keep you at a level to develop your skills in fencing that would translate over into combat. So in the perspective that this was used by a warrior or was used to train practical sword play, it would match the methods and handling of Jian on the battlefield. Now with that established, looking at the overall length of the blade, it's pretty obvious that reach is the game and any kind of long range quick techniques like taps or thrusts are going to be used to reach the opponent faster. Now this isn't to say that powerful cutting techniques wouldn't have been emphasized, but there's no benefit in a game of tag if you have a stronger strike versus just a quick, fast touch. And if that's what we're looking at for these rules, I would think that uh, first touch, taps, and thrusting would have been the favored techniques. If that really was the case, then we can further assume that a point system was used, whether for first touch or for certain parts of the body being worth more points, like the head, the heart, or the gut. We can see how it would have matched modern point systems like foil fencing or even the martial arts school's foam weapon sparring. Now, in my experience, that's a great way to understand point systems where we had one point for hitting the body, two points for hitting the head, and then it was a first to reach five points. Now, you could also do something where it's a timed round and whoever gets the most points wins, or you could even do more of a combination styled sparring where whoever dominates the match in either the time limit or for the amount of the exchange gets a point to win. Now, on a final note of speculation, I want to take into account the flexibility of the swords. Now, flexibility is important first off because you need a sword that's not going to break under its own weight, especially with these long han jian. However, these are quite extremely flexible, which is more important for shock absorption, especially with how often these would be banging and clanging as fencing swords. All right, so now that we've talked about how these swords were used, let's talk about how these swords can be used today in more modern training. Well, obviously, they can be unique additions to your collection, especially if your theme is Han Dynasty weaponry. The blunted versions are actually made for sparring, so you can use these swords as they were intended and add a new dimension to your Chinese historical fencing. You can use them for target cutting, for all fundamental Jian techniques and even variations. I was extremely impressed as to how efficient these acted as target cutting swords for both thrusting and for cutting. But how do they function in traditional Chinese martial arts Jian Fa and Jian Shu? Are they viable swords for traditional Tai Chi, Kung Fu and other styles of swordsmanship training? The answer? Yes. I mean, it's no surprise that a jian functions as a jian. However, you might expect some difficulties just due to the length and the extra hardware to doing some of the traditional postures and techniques. To test their compatibility, I ran each sword through some choi li fat jian, some tai chi jian, and some wu dang jian forms. And I noted the overall handling and feeling with these swords, as well as when I had to make modifications based on features or length of the blade. And here's what I came up with. Overall, between the two, the D-Guard Han Jian was just a little more compatible, and that simply came down to the shield guard getting in the way of a few techniques and hand positions, like when you do the double hand grab or some of the alternate hand grip positions, like when you have to put the thumb and the finger out, or if we do a left-handed grab of the sword in preparation of the form. The only other factor, which is a common note that I have for all Han Jian, is the length. It's not a permanent issue, you just have to take some time to get used to the reach. And since both of these swords are very light for their length, it's actually quite easy to get used to their reach. In the end, they actually both work very well with traditional Chinese martial arts forms training and worked and adapted well in each art. Now, whether you have to make a small modification here or there based off of the length or the extra hand hardware is really a small deal. I mean, if you are interested about these swords, 
you know, you can really pick them up and explore and learn a lot more about them. Before we end this video, I want to ask you two things. First, do you think that this style of sword and the sport of fencing had any effect on how Jian were actually used on the battlefield? And second, if you get the fencing swords, I would love to see footage of you fencing and using these swords and hear your thoughts about it. Because these are sharp swords, I cannot use them for fencing. It would just be too dangerous. So I am very interested to see, especially how these guards would have given an advantage. So if you do um, work with these swords, take a video, tag me in it. I'd love to see and hear your thoughts about it. Otherwise, big thanks to LK Chen for sending me these swords to review. As with every other sword, I'm always impressed with the level of craftsmanship and detail in the work. Now, as for everybody else, I would love to hear your feedback on these swords. How do you think these were used? Sharp? Dulled? Was there a fencing point system or was it based on combinations? I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on this. So as always, drop a comment down below and let me know what you think about these swords. Otherwise, thanks so much for watching. I'll see you in the next video.